your hosts have earned a reputation as fierce and effective advocates inside and outside of the courtroom. Both partners are experienced trial attorneys who have been board certified in family law by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization. All right, welcome back to For Better, Worse, or Divorce. I'm Brian Walters here with Jake Gilbreth. And today we're going to discuss uh, common law marriages or what's really an informal marriage is the legal term. Um, and so, Jake, do you want to tell us a little bit about that, about what the concept is behind it? Yeah, absolutely. The most common, you know, obviously, you know, marriage, go down to the courthouse or get a marriage certificate. That's a marriage with formalities. Texas does recognize, and not every state does, which can actually have an interesting interplay when a spouse is going through a divorce in Texas with an informal marriage. But Texas recognizes what we call informal marriage. I think people a lot of times say common law marriage, but like you said, it's the family code talks about marriage without formalities. And the concept is essentially that you can be married without actually having the formalities of a marriage license. Um, and the, the law would still recognize you as um, as married, and you would go through a divorce just like um, just like if you were formally married. Now you have to have that initial question though before going through a divorce um, when there's an informal marriage or common law marriage. You have to have the initial question about whether or not these people are married. And so the family code sets forth what needs to be. Um, proven in order for there to be informal marriage. The most simple is if there's a declaration of informal marriage, it's something you can fill out and it's filed. And that actually creates a presumption, um, a rebuttable presumption of an informal marriage. That's one way of it being proven. And what people most often hear about um, is essentially three prongs, uh, which is whether or not there's an agreement to be married. And after that agreement to be married, was there what we call holding out? The family code actually says if they represented to others that they were spouses, um, but we call it sort of holding out. So was there an agreement to be married and was there holding out um, and was there living together as husband and wife and all this having to take place um, within the state of Texas, the holding out and um, in, in living together in the state of uh, state of Texas. So it seems relatively straightforward, right? Just had to prove those three things um, may not be that easy. So how do you see, what what disagreements uh, do you see? And I will say it's rare um, that, you know, folks come in, they go, both sides go, yeah, that's right. We we're informally married. There's no dispute. Um, and we want to, we want to get divorced. But typically we see it when one person is claiming that there's an informal marriage and the other side is saying there was not an informal marriage. So well, how do you see this come up in your practice, Brian? Yeah, it, it comes up. Um, I, I think for me, there's also sort of a practical question, which is, is it is this a, a fight worth having, right? So um, why would it matter if you're married? Well, it, it, if you have children together, it doesn't matter, right? You can be married or not. It really essentially makes no difference. And so um, and the next, so then the question becomes money, right? It's about the rights um, to marital property or possibly to spousal maintenance um, that would that would exist if there was a marriage, which there might not otherwise be. And I think there's several situations where um, it, it still doesn't make sense um, to, to pursue it, right? I mean, if, for example, you've been married a very short time or, you, or nobody's acquired much in the way of marital property, you know, what's the point of having litigation about it? Uh, or if it's kind of a wash that it wouldn't really make any difference who, you know, whether you were married um, for, you know, however, the, however you handled your finances, it might not make sense at all. But, but typically what we see is when somebody comes in and, and they're wanting to prove it, it's that there would be a financial advantage to them. Um, let's say the other person earned more money than them during the marriage or. Uh, maybe they mar married a really long time and they think they're going to qualify for our alimony or spousal maintenance. So that that's usually where they, where it comes in. Right. And the um, and sometimes there's no dispute that they're married. And then the question is when where when they're married. Right. You right. see a lot of times um, couples where somebody says they were informally married, say, in 1995 and then seven years in, they decide to get formally married and go down and get a marriage certificate. Don't change anything, though. 
And then one spouse says, well, the date of marriage is 2002 when we got formally married. And then the other spouse says, no, it was 1995 whenever we began living, you know, whenever we agreed to be married and thereafter lived together as husband and wife in the state of Texas. And they are represented to others that we were married. Um, and that can have a huge uh, impact on the finances of it. Yeah, I mean, like you said, we have kids. We're going to be going through a custody, um, I guess, dispute or fight. May not be a fight, um, but we're going to have to resolve custody matters uh, for the child. But you know, it could have a huge impact on whether or not things are community um, property and, and divisible, um, or if we're not married. Because if we're not married, you know, if, if Brian and I are living together, and somebody says, and I say we're informally married, and Brian says, no, we're not. Uh, that could have a huge difference because if we're not, then um, we're just roommates. Then we just take our own stuff and go. Uh, but if we're married, then that's obviously a much bigger, bigger topic. And then obviously the date of marriage can make a difference, right? If, if you see it sometimes, some maybe somebody purchased a house during the time that somebody claimed that they were informally married, and then they got legally married at, after the purchase of the house. And then that question can determine whether or not the house is separate um separate property or community property or not can have huge i mean i've seen them in the millions they got millions of dollars worth of um financial repercussions so how do you prove it um if you have the person coming in the in, uh same informal marriage brian what type of stuff do you typically see um to uh to prove an informal marriage yeah i mean i would i would want to see things like um tax returns. Uh, that's pretty important. Um, so, uh, for example, it, you're required to, if you earn a certain amount of income or certain things happen in your life financially, you're required to, to file an income tax return. And, and it's a uh, against the law to improperly, to put anything false on a tax return, right? Including whether you're, and you have pretty much the first thing you have to do on your tax return is say, my, my marital status is single, or married, one of the two, or separated is the third one, I guess, which we don't have in Texas. But um, and so, if someone has filed or a couple's filed tax returns for twenty years that they've been living together, and and for twenty years they've told the IRS, I'm seeing both of them have said I'm single. You know, that's going to be a, a pretty hard road to hoe, I think. Another one um, is uh, insurance documents. Typically, when you apply for auto insurance or health insurance or life insurance, you need to disclose your marital status is another common one. Um, when you purchase a piece of real estate, the example you used, um, the deed will say specifically, you know, this person is a married person or a single person. Um, and you're, you're signing the deed saying, yes, I am married or yes, I am single. Uh, those are all ones that, that come to come to mind. I think these days a little bit, um, some other common ones are social media postings. You know, did someone you know, seven years ago, post on right. Facebook, hey, we just got married today in our backyard. Um, and, you know, and the other person who they married, you know, put a like on it. I mean, that's going to be sounds like an agreement to marry. And it sounds like there was a, a date for that, too. So uh, all those kind of things can occur. Um, formation of a business is another one. Um, sometimes that does uh, require you or sometimes people put their marital status in that. And I think the formation of a business, I've got one of these right now, is is another very high leverage moment where uh, the way that the laws are in Texas, if your business is you know, LLC, whatever is formed before the marriage um, and stays in LLC and, and stays essentially unchanged, then uh, that's going to be, a, and it becomes very valuable as in this case, um, that's going to be a big deal versus whether it was formed during the marriage and regardless of who's on the LLC. So those are all things that, that come up. Well, I never, I'd yet to see one that's all the same, right? It's always some different piece of evidence. Um, it, it always comes from different, uh, different aspects of, of folks' lives. I, I will say, I don't think I've ever seen one where somebody's filed tax returns as maximum. I think the first one I litigated, they actually did file tax returns as married, which made the case relatively straightforward and easy at that point. You know, the spouse claiming they weren't informally married, it's like you represented to the uh, federal government that you were kind of the end of the conversation on that one. But a lot of times they're not, you know, as clean cut, you know, somebody's, and maybe it's one, one, um, purported spouse never saw the tax returns or never filed his or her own tax returns or just never thought of it. Right. And, um, 
And, you know, it's, it's, and all this sort of goes to holding out, right? They represented to others that you were married. Uh, and, and that's the type of stuff that, you know, that's, that's kind of in the conversation, right? You file a tax return, you say you were married. Okay, there we go. That's, that's black and white. It's on paper. We can see it. Health insurance, we can see it. Um, although there's, you know, people usually come up with some story. Um, but sometimes it's just not that clear, but you can have holding out by witnesses coming in and saying, you know, look, here's, I, I met them at a, at a, you know, our kid's birthday party two years ago. And he said, this is my wife, so-and-so. And she said, this is my husband, so-and-so. There we go. I mean, they, that alone could meet the element of represented to others. I think does meet the element of representing to others that your husband and wife, that you're married. Um, it could be, you know, exchange of, uh, um, exchange of cards. I've seen people uh, use that as evidence. They refer to each other as husband and wife, or I think uh, hubby. I think I saw one where they referred to each other as husby, hubby and wifey. Um, and there was a dispute about whether or not they were informally married. Uh, but in what's interesting to me, it's all uh, folks' reputation is case law that says a reputation the community is being married could be evidence of holding out. Um, just neighbors, friends um, coming in saying, we thought these people were married. Uh, we just always assume that these people were married. Um, that could be evidence of holding out. So, there's, you know, that's more concrete evidence. In my opinion, sort of the hardest thing is not necessarily the holding out. I mean, you either have holding out or you don't. And, and you, people can usually scrape together some holding out evidence if they're going to make the claim, right? Some witness is going to come in and say, I, uh, I heard them say husband and wife, right? Um and if you can't even scrape together that evidence, then it's probably, you know, a bit problematic in bringing your informal marriage claim. The the big, and you know, living together as husband and, and wife um, in the state of Texas, that's usually not difficult to prove. Um, you know, either you did or you didn't. Um, although I guess, Brian, have you ever litigated uh, whether or not what uh, as husband and wife means? Because I, I know there's conflicting case law throughout the states of what as husband and wife means right is it as simple as hey we live together um and that's it or we live together and we have sexual relations does that make you husband and wife or is there another component have you ever litigated that i haven't litigated it but it comes up and i just ask him if they're having sex and uh, i mean that's i think that's what that means um and i think that's also interesting about um the living together that way because then what if somebody break you know splits up and uh, for a while, then they get back together later. Um, is that a break in the marriage? Is that do they re, do you restart the clock? Does it end at some point? That's a that's an interesting question. Again, that's an issue we've got in, in a case I have right now that I have a hearing on tomorrow um, because there were because the case law is really clear. You have to have all three elements, right? Right, and then there's it says essentially that if you split up and then nobody claims in a, in a legal proceeding that you were married in, in an informal marriage, then it's like you never were. You've got basically two year statute of limitations to to come in and prove that. Um, I wonder what other states do. I know Texas is one of only eight states that, that has this. I wonder what other states do when, you know, some couple just didn't fill out the paperwork right down at the courthouse and they don't have informal marriage and 30 years later, you know, I don't know what happens if you didn't pay the right fee and you never got your marriage certificate stamped. And uh, 30 years later, you're, you're trying to get divorced and the state of Missouri tells you, you, you well, marry. you didn't get. Yeah, I don't know. I removed to another state, too. That's a whole nother adventure in this. Whole it, it's interesting to me every single time I, I litigate them that there's not a ton of case law out there, um, you know, on this. They're they usually get resolved or. Um, you know, there's just not a, there's not a ton, you know, on, on, for example, the, uh, statute of limitations you mentioned, that's, you know, that's there, but it's also a presumption, right? The family code says, if you separate, um, and there's not a, if there's not a divorce filed within two years of separation, it's a presumption that there was an informal marriage, but it's not, uh, you can overcome the presumption. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've tried those cases before where people separated, um, I tried one going all the way back to 1995 when they separated 1998, which is an interest, another interesting topic about informal marriage. Um, and and uh, uh, research this and see what the, what the, and there's not a whole lot of case law on it, but you know, what happens, um, you know, a lot of times you'll see situations where people separate 
uh, and they've uh, and nobody files for divorce. And then years later, and you see this in probate too. Years later, somebody comes in and claims informal marriage. And what's interesting is there's no, no there's no informal divorce, right? There's only formal divorce. So think about that, right? It's, let's say, say me and somebody get informally married in 1995 and there's evidence that we agreed to be married and we held it how it's married and then we separate in 1995 and let's say i go down down the, the um my way and i i never i'm not going to file for divorce because i never think that we were informally married I, I think there wasn't an agreement and so obviously me is the person not saying an informal marriage i'm not motivated to go down the courthouse and I guess it had to be through a declaratory judgment and file a declaratory judgment action that I'm not married. Obviously, I'm not going to do that. Well, the person that thinks we are married, what if seven years from there, Jake gets run over by a bus? Um, and I don't have, you know, the only heirs are my children. And then somebody shows up from 1995 and says, hold on, uh, I was informally married to him. And here's the evidence, right? And at no point um, from 1995 to when I get hit by a bus, would there really be a legal mechanism for me to say, um, I'll get the technically correct answer in a second, but really there's no legal divorce for me to go in and file some of the courthouse to say, hey, by the way, that person I lived with back in 95, we weren't married. And just so if I ever die, uh, don't let any of my assets go to her um, or don't let me get sued. The technically correct answer is I, you can file a declaratory judgment laws who declaring that you're not married. Um, but who on earth is going to do that? Um, so that's an interesting topic that comes up. The other interesting topic kind of going on what you were talking about, Brian, I think the case law is really clear is that Texas and the Supreme Court is waiting on this, says you cannot have an informal marriage date from a time period when you're living in a state that does not recognize informal marriage. So New Jersey, for example, New Jersey does not recognize informal marriage. So let's say it's in undisputed uh, that when in 1998, they agreed to be married, told everybody we were married, had a big wedding ceremony, but never formally did it in a state that doesn't recognize informal marriage. And then 15 years later, they moved to the state of Texas. Um, and then 20 years later, they're going, you know, somebody wants to go through a divorce. So what's your date of marriage? Uh, is it the second you step into the state of Texas? Do you have to have a new agreement? I'll tell you, I've argued that um, on a district court level it has not gone up an appeal yet. Um, but do I have to have a new agreement? Do I have to, once I cross the borders of this great state, do I have to look in my spouse's or I guess not that time spouse's eyes and say, now that we're in the state of Texas, uh, I would like to agree once more that we are uh, husband and wife. I mean, it's just stuff that nobody thinks of, right? And this, this is why these cases are so interesting and every single one's different. And there's a lot of I don't knows. <laughs> yeah, right. There's a, vari a variation on that question I had a while ago, which is also answers one of the questions we had asked for us is, does this apply to same-sex marriages, which it, it does. We, we refer to husband and wife just because that's what kind of what the statutes say, but um, but it certainly does. It makes no difference anymore. But then what about a point when um, in Texas you couldn't have a same-sex marriage? What if you got together, as this case I had in the 70s, um, two ladies and lived together um, but could not get formally married. You could not get informally married at that point. And then it became legal one day. And, and in fact, it, it voided the Texas statute. So that there was several interesting cases that came up around that time. And they're probably still somewhere floating around out there. Uh, people just haven't split up yet. But uh, the question was, well, did you become married? If you were living together and had an agreement to be married, did you be, but not formally, did you become married on the day Obergefell, I think, was the name of the Supreme Court case came down that said it's OK now. Or was it just back in time in the 70s when you uh, first started living together and had an agreement to, to be married, but couldn't but couldn't legally? And um, seems right. to be the conclusion was uh, that you could go back in time to whenever the you met the um, the the points of it, um, even if even if that was impossible to do at the time. And um, now, of course, if you did that in New Jersey, that would be a problem, right? Because then you couldn't, even though New Jersey doesn't, didn't allow, didn't allow it because you were same sex, it, they just didn't allow it, period. So, all very complicated. Sometimes. Well, the other thing that's interesting, yeah, on that, and I don't think it's been totally resolved is my understanding. Um, I, it will be at one point, but 
okay, here's a here's a fact scenario. I don't know if people find this interesting or not to to talk about. This is just two family lawyers kind of thinking about worst case scenario that hasn't been litigated. Okay, let's say in um, the 1980s, I'm in a same sex relationship, and I'm in the same sex relationship for just say two or three months. And I look over at this uh, gentleman that I care for very deeply. And I say, let's be married. Um, we agree to be married. We call our family. We say we're married. We live together as husband and husband. And But it's the 1980s. Um, and it took it's going to be another uh, 35 years before the U- U.S. Supreme Court finally comes in and says that we're going to treat same-sex couples like human beings. Uh, shocking that that took 35 years. But okay. Um, and then we said, oh, shocking or not shocking, depressingly, I guess, is, is the pain. Uh, but, but 35 years until they say that I can be married. Well, rewind to 1985. Let's say, you know, we're, we're together. We're married for a year. And then it doesn't work out or he cheats on me or he decides that um, I'm not as charming or as interesting as I think I am. And he leaves me. Well, sitting there in 1986, I can't get divorced, Right. If I'm not in, say I'm only 22 years old or something like that, and I cannot get divorced in 1986 in any state in the United States, I'm a same sex couple, I cannot get divorced. And then, but you're telling me if I stay unmarried or even if I remarry, you know, Oberfield uh, comes down and you say, well, then your date of marriage is back when we, it's undisputed that you agree, held out, represented others, lived together as husband and husband. Well, time out. That's, that's uh, I would have divorced this guy back in the 80s uh, if you told me that I could have done that. So that's, you know, but but then on the flip side, how could it be the date of the U.S. Supreme Court decision? Because there's always been that fundamental right um, to get married. It's just we didn't recognize that fundamental right until 2015. So all all interesting. Um, and, and it comes down to every single case is different. Uh, and every single case is very, very fact specific. Um, and it just requires you know, strong advocacy, advocacy for your clients, but it, but it can have a huge result on, um, on somebody. Cause again, we, once there's that, um, establishment that there is an informal marriage, well, then you just proceed like any other divorce, um, which every single divorce is different, but the debt is to, you know, the assets, the debt, uh, the marital estate is divided in a just and right manner just as if we have a formal marriage uh, certificate. Uh, so a lot of times people have questions, you know, are our assets going to be the same? Is spousal maintenance going to be the same? Um, is separate versus community going to be the same? And the answer is yes. It's going to be exactly the same once we establish, you know, one, what's the date of ma- Were you all married? And two, what's the date of marriage? Once that's established, then it just proceeds as any other divorce. So talk to me about this, Brian. Do you, I want to talk about bifurcation and, and jury trials. Do you like to uh, – what is bifurcation, and do you think that has benefits in an informal marriage uh, litigation? Yeah, in fact, one I have right now, we're I actually have a hearing tomorrow requesting a bifurcation. And bifurcation just means to break it into two pieces, right? So, you know, why here, – and here's the reason you do that is that it's – it takes a lot of time, effort, money to get ready for a trial – um, and the more complicated the trial, the more issues there are, the more time, money, and effort it takes, and the longer it gets to trial. So if you have this threshold issue of were you actually married inform- informally in this case, um, if you get that issue resolved, then if, if the court says, no, you weren't, then we don't have to get into all the money stuff, right? Who owned what when? How much is the business worth? Whose debt is, you know, who's going to get stuck with this debt? Is there going to be spousal maintenance? All that kind of stuff. So Typically, um, especially if I'm defending one of these uh, where we're saying there's not a um, there's not been a marriage, then I'd want it bifurcated to try to get that specific issue. Are, were you ever married? Resolved. If I think, especially if I think we're going to win it, then win it quickly, easily, cheaply, and uh, get my client on with their life uh, versus otherwise. Now. Um, it's probably, if the answer is yes, um, you are married and now you need to go to redo every, figure out all the money stuff and then come back for another trial. Um, and I handled one of those type of cases, um, last year, um, there is, um, then that's probably more expensive in total, uh, I would say to do it twice because you've got two trials, right. And it takes longer. Uh, however, the, the reality is most, you know, statistically most cases settle, um, and therefore 
you probably uh, you probably would be best off getting it uh, the bifurcated and get that first question answered. Or maybe that leads to a settlement of the whole matter at some point, because probably what's going to happen is you're going to tell your client, look, I mean, that, that's reality, right? Trial, we're not, we can't ever say 100% something's going to occur because we're not a judge and, and our law is usually not that clear. Um, so we might say to a client that we're defending, you know, I think there's an 80% chance that you will, uh, the court will find that you're not married. But if that 20% chance comes through, you know, you could be on the hook to give them a $2 million, right? So if it's just a business decision, you'd say, well, 20% of $2 million is uh, $400,000. And, you know, you could, one option would be to settle in that range um, and be done with it and not spend a bunch of money on lawyers on top of it. Um, some people don't want to do that, right? I mean, I, you know, I was not married and I, I'm not going to pay this person a penny. They're just trying to suck me dry. And I totally get that. Um, so yeah, that's a long answer to, a, to your question. I hope that was helpful. Well, it all comes down to it depends, right? And anytime there's an unknown in the litigation, because only a bad lawyer will give a guarantee. Um, and, and that's a sign of a bad lawyer, somebody who's just trying to sell you something that they say, I guarantee you this will happen down at the courthouse. That is a, that is a sign of a bad lawyer. Uh, we can talk about what's likely to happen and what the law is, but there are no guarantees um, as us litigators find out um, all the time. But anytime there's an unknown, right? Because if you're claiming informal marriage and you know, you're seeing there, if it, even if you think you have the strongest case in the world, 90% chance that we're going to win uh, this. But that 10% is a you lose period. Um, if it's a no on informal marriage, a lot of times there may be some legal claims um, depending on the relationship. But a lot of times that means that you get nothing. And so even if you think, and so anytime there's that uncertainty, and again, on the flip side, you're saying there is no informal marriage. I'm not paying them anything. Well, let's say we go down to a judge or a jury. We'll talk about a jury in just a second. And they say, yeah, you are. You are informally married. Well, there goes your leverage, um, you know, with the other side when you sit there. And once you get that question answered, somebody's going to lose a lot of leverage. You know, right. Somebody's either going to be completely out um, if they're claiming informal marriage or somebody's going to be, not going to be able to use that as leverage. And it's awful, to obviously, to think about things this way, um, you know, particularly when there's kids involved and it's family law and it's sensitive. But that's what you have to – that's how you have to think about it, the, the business aspect of, of a divorce and when there's a disagreement. And that's, you know, something that we do and advise clients on. And then one more thing that – well, lots of things to, to toss in the mix. Um, but one more major thing to talk, talk, uh, toss into the mix is jury versus – non-jury. So a jury can actually decide whether or not folks are informally married or not, which I think surprises a lot of people. They just think that we can go talk to a judge. Um, but you can make a jury demand on this. Have you ever had to litigate one of those? Yes. And, um, you know, and that's putting it in the hands of a jury instead of a judge, which has its pluses and minuses, right? And um, it's, it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's an option you might do if you get a sense that the judge um, isn't leaning your way in some of the preliminary hearings or has a history or reputation of being, let's say, skeptical or, or very open to informal marriage claims, depending on which side of it you're, you're defending against. So all those things are certainly worth keeping, keeping in mind. Right. And it's something that that discussion that you have to have with your lawyer from the very beginning of the case, it should be talked about. Um, on both sides, claiming the informal marriage, denying the informal marriage, you know, you need a lawyer that can sit there and, and know the judge, a judge or judges that you could possibly get, um, and somebody who's litigated these before uh, in front of juries. And I, I think most judges appreciate that there's a jury option out there. I have one right now that's going on, and the judge, frankly, didn't see it um, our client's way 100%. Uh, she did a lot of the ways. Um, on, on temporary orders hearing, but not 100% there, um, which, you know, disagreed with and is actually up on appeal. But she was very frank and said, okay, well, it's a temporary order. This is how I see it. And now I know that Jake's going to make a jury demand. And she was right. Um, and we did. And that's going to be – we just felt in that case that the jury is going to give our client a better shake. Some cases you think that the judge is going to give you a better shake. It's a judgment call um, at the end of the day. Sometimes it's out of your hands, right? The other side makes the demand. Um, then there you go. You're going to be trying this to a jury. But my experience is that, um, you know, juries, uh, for, for lawyers who don't try cases to juries, I think a lot of times 
they kind of roll their eyes and say, can you it's just, you know, roll the dice and it's just crazy putting this decision into the hands of 12 citizens in whatever county that you, you live in or six if you're in county court. Uh, my experience has been that they listen, uh, they try really hard to be fair, and they also try really hard to follow the law, really, really hard to try follow the law. They'll be charged, um, charges the instructions from the court, they'll be charged on what an informal marriage is. And anytime I've tried any any type of property or legal question to a jury, uh, my experience is that they try really, really hard. They don't just decide what they want to do and just, you know, get there. They try really hard to get it right. Um, and I think they do a really good job. So, um, you know, again, it's just a discussion to have in every single case. But every single case is very different. They're they're fascinating cases. They can be, you know, emotionally difficult, obviously. You have one somebody that believes that they were married. Um, and then, or at least saying that they believe that they were married, and then one person that believes they weren't married, or at least saying that they believe that they weren't married. And that can be, you know, kind of surprising litigation, I think, for people to go through. Um, and it can have a huge impact. But, you know, um, it's uh, there's a resolution to it. There will be an answer, and there is there is a way move, moving forward. So I think that covers kind of broad strokes, uh, informal marriage. We could talk about the ones that we've done all day long, but that's uh, I think that gets us kind of a, a good overview of it. Obviously, there's more information on our website uh, and you can contact our office. So if you like what you've heard today, of course, as always, do us a favor and leave a review. We appreciate all the feedback we get. We really appreciate it when people suggest topics. Uh, this topic, for example, came from a webinar that we recently did. Um, but we love feedback. We love reviews. Uh, we want to make this podcast uh, interesting for everybody and to cover informative topics for y'all. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at podcast at waltersgilbert.com. I'm Jake Gilbert, and I'm here with Brian Walters, and thank you all for listening. For information about the topics covered in today's episode and more, you can visit our website at waltersgilbert.com. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode of For Better, Worse, or Divorce, where we post new episodes every first and third Wednesday. Do you have a topic you want discussed or a question for our hosts? Email us at podcast at waltersgilbreath.com. Thanks for listening. Until next time.